In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. On December 7th, 1941, my grandfather, Bill Washi Moss, his middle name was Washburn, was flying as the first officer aboard the Philippine Clipper on its way to Pearl Harbor. Word of the attack on Pearl Harbor went over the radio, and they were ordered to open a secret envelope, which was carried aboard all Pan Am passenger airplanes. And they opened it, and they were instructed to execute Order 7, Code A, which simply instructed them to land at the nearest available uh, Pan Am station, which happened to be Wake Island. So they dumped about 3,000 pounds of fuel so that they could land safely and landed in a lagoon at, it was a flying boat, and they landed in the water and uh, taxied to the, uh, the Pan Am service area, which was also a military base as well. And word spread about the attack, and so the commander in charge of this particular uh, station decided that he would commission uh, Captain Hamilton of the, uh, of the plane, as well as my grandfather, to fly a reconnaissance mission to see uh, how far the attack had gone and so on. So while they were preparing the airplane and taking out as much extra stuff as they could to reduce the weight to increase the range, uh, they had separated from the airplane when the Japanese decided to attack Wake Island. At the time, Captain Hamilton was in a jeep going down the runway, and his driver, who was Chinese, as it happens, um, the bombs started falling all around them, and this guy said, uh, we don't stand a Chinaman's chance. Uh, kind of ironic. Uh, but they, uh, so they jumped out of the jeep and scurried for cover. Captain Hamilton jumped into a crater that had been recently been formed by one of the dropped Japanese bombs until he found that it was too hot to be in it, so he jumped out and ran to another uh, secure place. My grandfather, meanwhile, was in the Pan Am hotel facilities, I guess probably catching a catnap while they prepared the plane. And when he heard the bombs, he scurried out, and he saw the airplanes flying by and, and strafing everywhere and dropping bombs everywhere. He dove into the sand. He remarked that the airplanes, the Japanese Zero fighters that were flying in formation, were flying so close and so perfectly that it looked like they were on parade. He remembers that a bullet landed a couple of feet from his head. But of course, it didn't hit him, or I wouldn't be here. After the attack had finished, they went back to the clipper, and it had 23 holes in it. But this was not a pressurized airplane, and it hadn't hit any vital systems, so they simply started getting everybody on board and getting ready to do this reconnaissance flight, and they did. My grandfather spoke to me about how afraid they were that as they flew closer to Pearl Harbor, they might get shot down by their own friendly forces, or, uh, some, or the Japanese might still be in the area. But as it was, nothing like that happened, and when they flew into Pearl Harbor, my grandfather was one of the first people to see it on fire from the air, a sight that he never forgot, and he described as sickening him. The challenge on Remembrance Day often is that as we tell these kinds of stories, we have to be honest about the dual nature of our, of our feelings toward war. We're somewhat conflicted. On the one hand, I tell a story like that, and you get a little bit of kind of a sense of, a little bit of a thrill. You know, I'm, I'm very proud of my grandfather, and wow, you know, he was under fire, and kind of isn't that exciting and, and kind of cool. Unfortunately, we have to deal with the reality that, that war is a deep part of human experience. Uh, there's a, a great bi uh, book by John Keegan, who's a historian, called A Brief History of War. It's not that brief, it's about 500 pages, but it's, it's a description of the history of war in human, in human society. And he basically explains that, that war is not, as some would suggest, a continuation of a political experience. In other words, it's not the extension of political activity, but it's actually a cultural one. In other words, peoples go to war with each other rather than nations going to war with each other. And he talks about how uh, anthropologists are really deeply divided on this question of whether violence is part of human nature or not, whether it's sort of fundamental to human culture. And they look at these early societies, you know, before they had things like the compound bow and other weapons that, were, that are lethal, and they find there's a sort of horizon of violence that happens. There's a certain point at which the violence is actually not meant to kill anybody or even permanently injure them. There are some tribes where, you know, they'll, they'll go to war, and if somebody gets seriously hurt, they'll actually stop the war so that they can get medical treatment, right? Because the point is not actually to kill people, the, the violence is serving some other kind of need. But as the technology starts to evolve and lethality starts to come into it, the na nature of war changes and becomes more violent. It's strange to me, sometimes when Henry and I are playing, or we might be playing tackle or something like that, he'll sometimes in his place say, I kill you, I killed you. And then I have to lie very still. And then he'll say, all right, you're alive again, you're alive again. Kind of neat how he has resurrection in there, at least. But it does kind of bother me a bit that part of his play is that pew-pew, you know, kind of stuff. And, you know, parents come out differently about how they feel about that and how they, how they set limits on the children's play. But, for example, he can't play that way at school. But still, it is part of the human experience. So what do we do with it?
Interestingly, I think this kind of essential bloodlust or something that's in human culture, this potential for violence, is exacerbated by some of the social constructs that we find ourselves in. A classic example is something called the myth of redemptive violence, a term first coined by Walter Wink in his really excellent book called The Powers That Be. Walter Wink was looking at the causes of, of violence in society and, and how we understand it and how we talk about it. And one of the things he noticed is that throughout culture there's this kind of repeating archetype or plot line story which kind of involves a heroic figure who goes outside of the law in order to restore the balance of the moral universe through a violent act. And um, this, this appears again and again. A classic example is, is 007, James Bond. You know, he's licensed to kill, but often he does so outside the parameters of, of a just society. Like he does so without, he, he does these uh, extrajudicial killings and things like that. But we don't hesitate to sort of celebrate him as a figure of, of, of kind of a heroic figure in our society. Maybe the best example in the current uh, culture is Jack Bauer, the figure from the show 24, who will do just about anything. No act of violence is, 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 too, is too little for this character in order for him to you know, serve the better good by preventing some kind of terrorist attack. So part of the myth of redemptive violence is that that kind of going outside the law is necessary in order to, uh, for the greater good, for the sake of the greater good. Now, interestingly, that notion of redemptive violence and the, and the kind of hero, hero going outside the structure of the law is not how people in the, in the military are trained. Uh, they're actually trained to work as part of a team, and they're, they're actually, these days, uh, the, the thinking is they want to suppress people's urge to be heroic because they're more effective when they work as a team together rather than trying to uh, change the battle course through one heroic act. They want people to work collectively together. Interestingly, in Canadian society, there's been a marked shift in the rhetoric that we use around war. There was an interesting article in the Globe and Mail about this recently, and it was quoting two books, one by Ian McKay called The Warrior Nation, and another by Noah Kitchler called What We Talk About When We Talk About War. And in both those books, there's a discussion of how in Canadian society over the past 10 years, there's been a shift in how we talk about uh, soldiers that has moved from a kind of victim language, that people are, that the, that the soldiers are themselves victims of war and that they've seen terrible things and they've been scarred by their experience, to a language of, of the heroic. These are now heroes, not victims. And you can see this in, in various ways. An example is that uh, increasingly the reference to Canadian hero heroicism is not necessarily Passchendaele, where 16,000 Canadian soldiers died for basically no reason, but instead Vimy Ridge, where 10,000 died uh, for a small tactical gain. So the story is shifting from you know, senseless violence to violence that has some sort of meaning or, or progresses the, the allied cause or something like that. So, of course, no one's going to resist the hero language. I mean, nobody's going to say, oh, these men aren't heroes. Of course they are. But there's something else going on here. There's something about how we as a society are framing violence to make it more acceptable, more palatable. And that may be expected after 12 years of war that we've been in in Afghanistan. But still, as Christians, we maybe need a new frame, a new way to contextualize this. I would suggest to you that war itself is actually a sin in the sense that we are all God's children. And God cries when people are killing each other. That this is not a good thing. This is a fundamental break with both creation and with each other. It's a profound and social sin and one that we have to repent of. We have to, as much as we remember the heroes and, and, and celebrate all those who sacrifice so that we can have the life that we have and the freedoms that we enjoy and so on, uh, even as we do all of that, we have to acknowledge that war itself is a sin and is never God's intention for his people. There's other frames we can apply to. One that's very helpful through history is the just war theory. See, here's the problem. We might say that war is bad, but the problem is that sometimes we also seem to have to say that war is necessary. Here's a classic thought example. What to do about Hitler, right? Now, uh, famously if in, in the internet world, when you do the argument of ad reductio hitlerium, when you, when you bring up Hitler, you've lost the argument, but I think I'll win this one. I think most people, if confronted with the opportunity to personally kill Hitler, if they've sort of considered it in the context of, of World War II, would probably do it out of, out of a sense of justice and out of a sense of the greater good. And, but I only know of one saint that actually had that opportunity, and he was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German theologian, university professor, and pastor, actually had a chance to try to kill Hitler, and did. He was part of a plot to kill Hitler. And it was one of the reasons why he was arrested and later executed, because he tried to kill Hitler. This deeply formed theologian, this deeply moral man, decided that in the face of the violence that Hitler represented and what he was doing, the only just response for a Christian was to kill this man in cold blood. 
Think about that. Just War Theory posits that there's a number of conditions that we have to solve to say that a war is justified in a Christian framework. It has to be for a good cause. It has to have a competent authority behind it. In other words, it has to be a whole sort of nation, or some sort of representative thing going on there. It has to have a right intention. It has to be proportional. And of course, it has to have a good chance of success and it must be a last resort. One might ask how many wars that we've been involved in in the past you know, 50, 100 years have fit all those criteria. Well, maybe not all of them. So what do we do as Christians in response to this? Uh, this kind of ambiguity of war and violence. So on the one hand, it's deplorable and sinful. On the other hand, it seems necessary and pragmatic sometimes. What do we do with the fact that if we're honest with ourselves, we find these stories of individual heroism and, and so on kind of thrilling in a way and, the, and that we kind of get excited by violence. I mean, what do, what do we do with that? Well, I would suggest that the gospel lesson that we have today, in which we have this discussion of life after death, gives us a bit of a clue. There's something in here about how the decisions that we make have consequences, but not necessarily the ones that we imagine. See, for the Sadducees, they had this very narrow conception of what life after death could mean, and it was to them absurd. It was absurd to imagine that a woman could marry all these men and that somehow, you know, she has to choose one of them in heaven. You know, how does, how does that work? Jesus rejects the very premise of their suggestion that life after death is so limited. That instead, it's something very big. Those who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage, and those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Indeed, they cannot die anymore because they are like angels and children of God, being children of the resurrection. Interesting. What is heaven like for the soldiers? What is it like? Well, the images that we have from Revelation and other places and, and from this passage suggest that it's actually a place of peace. If war is hell, literally, then the opposite of that, the kind of eternal heavenly peace, is really something to behold. And what a relief that might be for those who met their end in violent circumstances, to be in a place where they are even reconciled, perhaps, with their enemies, a place where they can sit down in the love of the Lord and sit and bask in glory and love. Now, as I, I customarily do, I'm going to sort of let you all end the sermon by feeding back a little bit. I, I, I put a lot on you in this particular sermon. Uh, I quoted a bunch of different people, and, and if you're curious about any of those books, I'll, I'll put them on the website, uh, on the sermon link, so you can, uh, you can look them up. Uh, the Walter Wink one, particularly, I would recommend, because it really talks about the way that language and rhetoric uh, impacts the way people understand violence and justify it. So, any responses to any of that? The ambiguity of war. <laughs>